let's uh let's open up with a word of prayer and, and get going on this. Lord, thank you so much for all the care and and um, provision that you make for your people. You know, we have uh, the Holy Spirit, and one would think that that would be more than sufficient um, as our paraclete come alongside us and comfort us and aid us and pray for us when we don't know what to pray. Oh Lord, that, that wasn't enough for you. You decided to, for your purposes, also provide living creatures, angelic beings, and uh, doing all kinds of things that most of which we're probably not even aware of, God. And we're so thankful for your magnificence and, and your glory. So help us to understand and comprehend what your word teaches, Lord, and uh, especially help me to teach it and to communicate it succinctly, Lord. But it's in Christ's name we pray and give you thanks. Um, we're going to cover four areas related to angels in the New Testament this morning. We're going to cover the role of angels in the New Testament, angels in the life of Jesus, the presence of angels in the early church, and depending on how much time is left, which I'm not banking on a lot, is angels in the end times. But we're going to get into more of that later on. So we're going to cover those four areas. I'm going to do my best. Now, I'm not handing out any, any sheets this time because, because if I do hand out any handouts, I'm going to hand them out at the end because um, it gets confusing otherwise, and I don't want... You know, sometimes I hand out handouts, and they're handouts to take home and study, and they're not necessarily an outline of where we're going that day, so I don't want any confusion there. So I'll do the best I can with with my notes and you shoot your hands up as you have been and ask any questions. I figure if the Lord can make a donkey talk, then I should be okay this morning, right? Uh, so the first point we're going to cover this morning is the role of angels. Now, uh, as we know, according to the angels or the Bible, angels are messengers of God who often, often deliver important information to humans. Um, in the Old Testament, we saw a good deal of this, and they stepped in and they gave messages, delivered prophecies to the uh, prof to the prophets, and so forth. And we don't see so much of that in the New Testament. And, and as you go through and you read, you might remember that there were significant events where they stepped in and communicated important events to. Uh, all kinds of people concerning big events in the life of Christ. But we, uh, we don't see the same type of activity that we saw in the Old Testament, really. It's a little bit different. Here they act more like heralds. So if you turn to Luke chapter 1, we're going to spend a little time in Luke. I'm going to mention three or four really big angel showings in Luke, but we're going to zero in and drill down on, on, a, on a big one in Luke, okay? Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, for instance, what I just want to mention is an angel came to the priest Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband, right? Do you remember what that event was about? The angel came to forerun about the forerunner. So he came and... Uh, now, an interesting thing happened when the angel came to give Zechariah the news, and Zechariah questioned, questioned him a little bit, and then what happened? Yeah. I mean, don't second-guess God, I guess, is the lesson. Now, do you think that that power and that decision to do that came directly from the angel, or did it come filtered through God? from God through the angel? Or do you think God saw what was going on, told the angel what was going on, and God made it happen. How do you think that maybe played out? Guesswork, right? Exactly right. And that's exactly. I think that's the right answer with anything. And Jesus, when he came down a little bit lower than the angels, and he came down in humility on the earth, as we read, especially in um, Philippians chapter two, um, he came down to be the lowest of the low among us. 
And everything that he got, he got from the Father. Special knowledge he got from the Father, power he got from the Father, any authority to do anything was from the Father. So certainly angels were going to be the same way. So I think that's the right answer. Um, so you see that in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 20, and we're not going to read through all of that. But that's about Zechariah and uh, what happened here. Now, also the other thing that happened that it's easy to overlook is, is um, the shepherds. Remember the angels coming and visiting the shepherds? They're out in the field. And uh, God sent an angel to them to make an announcement. Then in verse 26 to 38, the, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel appears to Mary. That's what I want to look at today. So Luke chapter 1, let's focus on this, okay? Gabriel's a big deal. So look at 26 to 38. Can I get a couple people to read? Maybe who wants to read verse 26 down to say through about verse 30? Okay, and I get somebody to read 31 down through 38. Who wants to get that? Any volunteers? In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Wow, amen. So, all the way up to last week, we looked at many Old Testament visitations, and the angels are delivering significant messages concerning, of course, the nation Israel in big events. Even Gabriel coming to Daniel, it was to deliver, essentially, Israel's future. He kind of laid out for him in the form of visions throughout the book, the future of Israel. And then we come here, and what do you see is a, 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 maybe a bit of a paradigm shift between the types of visitations that happened in the Old Testament versus here. I mean, in the Old Testament, I, you know, I mentioned before, making a donkey talk, there was all kinds of... Um, visitations, that was the angel of the Lord there, theophany, right? Um, where Christ showed up there, pre-incarnate Christ showed up there, as he did oftentimes, and sometimes it was to condemn and to bring judgment, like Sodom and Gomorrah, and we mentioned a little bit of that, and here we have this big paradigm shift of something really significant. What are your thoughts about that? Questions, comments? It's a good question. You mean after the cross and after the? They're still in the Old Testament here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're pivoting right here. Here's where the change is starting to shift, right? Yeah. Well, what can you think of? What? Mm -hmm. 
mentioned here in the book of Acts, Peter and Paul broke Peter out of prison. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get into those, yeah. In all those, in all those instances, do they know that they're interacting with angels? Yeah, I mean, for instance, um, you know, you brought up Paul. Um, I mean, it's recorded that there's an angel in Acts and uh, Peter's response that way. But Paul also mentions to the passengers on a ship that an angel, God sent me an angel and he said, we're all going to make it, guys. You know, it could be. I know we're all going to make it because I need to get to Rome. God wants me to go before Caesar. So God's decided to let you all live today. And that's what happened. The ship crashed on the shore. And he, so he, an angel. he did say it was an angel. In this revelation where John bows down and the angel says, what are you doing? I'm, no yeah, I'm a servant like you are. Don't do that. Yeah. So he actually, you know, would have witnessed the angel at that point. Here yeah. So yeah, not just a vision, right? Because they don't usually, usually have them bow down to a vision. I mean, it was a... Well, that, it would be a, a being with the Shekinah. I mean, they would be in the presence, so they would have some of that around them. Well, that's part of the conversation we're going to have here, too. And that is that, and that is, um, yeah, I mean, when, when you see angels appear, how do they usually appear? Usually. Or a different physical form, I don't know, you know, a different something that, like, you would bow down. And, and yeah. And one for the other. I usually see a couple different ways angels show up, like we see this in the Old Testament. A lot of times when they show up, it's like, you know, look like a man. A lot of times they'll say like, they will describe him as a man like unto the son of man. So there's something different about them in their the, their appearance where they go, this guy's special. You know, he's he's got the chiseled jaw and the cheekbones and he glows a little bit. Like this guy, there's something different about him. He's this guy's like, I guess probably they don't know what the son of man necessarily looks like. But when they say like unto the son of man, what they're thinking of is Hercules, you know, in our Western way of thinking. You're looking at somebody who's really chisel form, you know, uh, um, Thor, you know, how we envision, wow, this, this guy's different. This is like unto the Son of God. They'd see that. Other times it was, it seemed like there was no question at all because their robes would be shiny, right? And maybe the, the way they arrived would be really spectacular. I don't know. It says that, you know, and then he flew in. Did he fly in or was he there quickly or... And then he and then he arrived. Sometimes he just arrived and he just said, "Whoa, where'd you come from?" And then they're shiny white, so it's, they would come in a couple of different ways. What's not clear is which way they look all the time or whatever. It's probably the shiny white robed kind of a thing. What does white usually? What is that usually emblematic of in the Bible as we read things? Purity. The purity of God, the purity of heaven, everything that God has and, and does is pure. And these are holy angels, so they're still in their purity, so they're in white. Those are some good observations. Okay, let's, let's take a look at some of these. So roles of angels, so they come and they deliver important news. This is really the biggest news that Israel's been waiting for, you know, I say forever, but, you know, we, it's for their entire history. In fact... It's probably fair to say that everybody who knew any of those stories at all before even Israel existed, you know, Noahic and all the way back, they were looking for the fulfillment of John, or Genesis 3.15, right? They were looking for that Messiah. So they've been waiting for this. Now we have this announcement. What do you get from the significance of the announcement, though? Why did he go to the shepherds out in the field. And there have been sermons galore written on this one. What's the significance of that? You ever notice that kind of thing? How about this? As you're reading and you're, this, this is a, a look into the mind of God and how he does things. How about, why did Christ, after the resurrection, first reveal himself to women? It wasn't to the disciples, it wasn't to men. So God's way of thinking to establish or, or prove himself, <clears throat> to affirm himself 
in, is really a different way, a different mindset from what we would expect we'd want to do. We expect, like in the science fiction movies, if you're going to get an, a visitation from something off this world, somebody comes down and lands in the middle of the field and says, take me to your leader. And God goes and makes an announcement to women in front of the grave, shepherds in a field. Or else you announce the arrival of the Lamb of God. That's a good point, too. There might be, that might not be accidental, right? Okay, so those are some of the roles that we see them appearing that way. Uh, so in the, we're not done there, though, because what we've got is the angel Gabriel appearing, and Gabriel didn't just tell Mary what he's there to do at that point. He went on and told her the whole deal, right? What else did he say that um, Christ is going to do? And it's stuff that they really were expecting and knew from the Old Testament, right? You, you look down at, um, in chapter 1, verse 32. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And... The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. So they're excited now, right? And he will reign forever over the house of Jacob. And in his kingdom, there will be no end. So maybe this, as you read the New Testament, <clears throat> you can get some understanding of how the disciples were confused. Lord, <clears throat> who gets to sit on your right side? Who gets to sit on your left that kind of thing, because they're looking for the Messiah on the white horse to come in, wipe out those who enslaved them, which at the time was Rome, and then take over. He's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to set up David's throne in Jerusalem. They understood it that way, right? They didn't understand that it was up in, in glory somewhere. That's David's throne is in Jerusalem. That's where we're going. That's where he's going to set up his throne. He's going to set up his kingdom. Yay, he's finally here. This is it, folks. So then when we get to the point where we get Jesus three or four times keeps trying to tell them, tell the disciples that the Son of Man must first lay down his life. They weren't making that connection, right? So we're gonna get we're gonna get to, we'll get there, but what happens also after this? So there's this announcement. Do you remember what else happens? We have Zechariah's prophecy, we have um, John the Baptist announced. Then you have the birth of Christ, right? At the birth of Christ, the shepherds are informed. Angels come and tell the shepherds. But then what happens? They get another important visitation or two, right? Do you remember, though, But even before the birth of Christ, there were separate visitations. Mary didn't get, wasn't the only one who got a visitation. Who else got a visitation? Exactly, Joseph did. Joseph got a visitation. Why would that be important? Because Mary's coming to Joseph and saying, oh, yeah, you know, I know I'm pregnant and stuff, but it was God. <laughs> and so Joseph's going, hold on here. So the Lord forecasts all this. And then after the birth, Joseph got another important visitation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, when it was when he needed to depart to Egypt? Yeah. So... Flip real quick to um, Hebrews 1. Let's look at another one here. Speaking of roles of angels. So do angels just show up willy-nilly every day in our lives? Today? We don't really see that, do we? There's special significance, and it's not just for menial things. Okay, now, in Hebrews, the writer sp spends a lot of time talking to the Hebrews about Messiah, about Christ, and how he is better, and he's a better way than all the things they'd known in the past, right? Better than the prophets, better than the sacrifices, better than the temple, better than Abraham, better than Moses. So this is the theme of most of the book. Chapter 1, he's talking about angels. Let 
let's see. Let's let's take a look at. Uh, let's just pick it up at verse thirteen. And to which of the angels has he ever said, "Sit at my right hand"? until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? That's interesting, interesting wording, interesting way that that's framed, right? So they are, verse 14, ministering spirits sent out sent out to serve who? Well, it's for the sake of those, those who what? Are to inherit salvation. So, it sounds like we have bodyguards until we inherit salvation. What does that mean? Isn't that interesting wording? It doesn't say those who have inherited salvation. That's just something for you to chew on there for a while. There's a, a lot of debate and discussion over that, but the wording on there is kind of provocative. Wouldn't you say, what do you think about that? I mean like ultimate salvation though, right? Deliverance means there is that argument that it's to protect those until we're, you know, glorified. Because, I mean, you know, you, the, the instances that we talked about a while ago, it was some of those that were mentioned. Paul and others, right? I mean, they had already inherited salvation, right? Right. That's right. So the ministering that we see going on there, it wasn't like up until, you know, they came to Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, would want, I, I guess I'd be inclined to think it's compared to our ultimate belief. It could be. I wonder how, like, you know, does this happen to every believer? Do they get a ministry yeah. at some point in their life, or are there just certain people within God's people? Key, key people to make, that God has it superintended yeah. to make some certain things happen, trigger things, events. And when we get to heaven, only then will we really know, like, how is there were six people in life that? Yeah. I, I do have a handout that I that you can't have after the fact, but I just printed the page about um, guardian angels from gotquestions.org, .org, and uh, it's a good website. I'm not going to say everything that they say is gospel and correct, but it's interesting, and they just kind of state the arguments, the positions there, and what verses it comes from about guardian angels and whether or not we have guardian angels, and it makes the conclusion rightly that ultimately God is our guardian, right? Nothing is going to happen to us that God doesn't want to happen. And, you know, if we're if we're supposed to be persecuted in some way, we're going to be persecuted, and if we're not, then God's going to sneak us out to Egypt, right? Something's going to go. Wow, we really missed. God really provided. Man, I couldn't believe we came this close to. You know, sometimes you hear these stories. We might have them, and you hear them a lot from missionaries, where it's like, wow, we really, you know. So yeah, God steps in that way. So. Those who will, I, mean, I think that's for all. No and like we talked about in Kevin's class, you know, Jacob, I've loved Esau, I've hated. Well, what did God do in the life of Jacob that he did not do in Esau? He intimately involved himself. So if God, if we just, and I'm just speaking here, but if we go back, God chose to love us before the foundation of our time. Before the foundations of the world, right? Of our time, there is no distinction of, oh, he only loved us when we got saved. No, he loved us. From the beginning, so yeah. ministering spirits and those of us who are going to inherit salvation, it starts from way back. So there's no dispute. I mean, his involvement in our life isn't clarified. Our involvement, the other two. Yeah, and I guess the question comes: How? At what point does God feel the need to send an angel to intervene or not? And like you said, he'll probably we'll find out someday, and we just we just can't know. This week in Utah, I saw where there was a pastor in Africa where a slave stormed in the church to shoot him and the gun jam. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, Lord, wasn't his time yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some angel came and 
poked his sword in the trigger guard where the trigger wouldn't. <laughs> Make a great cinematic moment, right? Yeah. Ministering spirits really mean. Well, in the context there, if you look up a couple of verses, he's comparing Christ to angels. But ministering, ministering, now the word ministering is uh, what diakonos, I believe it's the same word you get deacons, servants to serve. So it encompasses whatever. Whatever is serving. It's God's bidding. God's bidding, right? Well, it does say we are to be an angel. Yes. Yeah, uh, 13, 13, 2. Hebrews 13, 2. Let's look at that. Same book. So flip toward the end of it. Thank you, Sarah. Nice transition. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Isn't that fascinating? Now, entertain doesn't mean, you know, but when somebody comes to your house and you're showing them hospitality and you're doing things for them, helping somebody on the street, uh, good Samaritan comes along, who knows, but that that guy laying on the ground who's injured, who knows, but that he might be an angel laying on the ground. And you go to help him, help him up, set him on his bike, send him on his way, ask him if he needs anything, slip him a couple bucks, whatever you got to do. And uh, guy rides down the street, goes around the corner and disappears. But we just don't know. But evidently, sometimes it says, sometimes we do this. We entertain angels unawares. That said, and it's a heart issue, right? That said, we should have that heart anyway, whether it's an angel or not, because God is always watching, right? And sometimes it's the right thing to do, and we need to stop, take a breath, and help people, and, and just be aware and keep an eye on that. But, so why do you think God would send angels to do that though is it we already have our salvation it's not to test us to decide if he's going to save us or not or whatever why would god do that do you think just don't know huh maybe, more mindful. maybe. just about you know we we do a motive check you know like if we're, if we're really not doing the right thing, we shouldn't do it because it's in a legalistic way, but yeah. maybe a little reminder that you never know. Yeah. And as so many of these things happen, these angel encounters happen um, at key moments, it could be a key moment in our life where um, we are grappling with and we are struggling with, and maybe we've been praying. You know, angels come a few times here and there in response to prayer. We've been praying, we're saying, God, I, I'm, I'm not seeing this here. And you're going through a trial and it's a character change. And what is it you're trying to teach me? What is it you're trying to show me? And maybe something happens at the right time to nudge you and to bump you off that spot and make you think about, oh, man, I, you know, I've been so involved in myself here. And, and, you know, it's not quite as bad as walking around with a cell phone in your face, but you get so self-centered and things you forget. And then you see somebody in need and you go to help them. So you're entertaining an angel unawares and it makes you realize that I need to just get on with the work and the business of God, right? And not just quit focusing up. So maybe God does these things to kind of bump us a little bit, give us a little, little nudge he will hit us in, the in some way. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be something we, we you know, we, we'll probably never know that it was an angel, but the Lord would use that in our lives to do something. He teaches us thing in the spirit. So in the spirit, we would notice them or we, it would get our, our spirit mind. Oh, notice the angel or just notice the person, the, the so-called, yeah. Yeah, spirit entity, I don't know how to use the right words. And so in our spirit, we would notice them. Yeah, or we would at least notice we're supposed to do something there. Yeah, that's significant. It's it's a significant moment that we're supposed to step in and respond the right way. Is there, is there, are there any instances in Scripture that we see that this happens? Like what it describes you, right? 
In other words, somebody we know now, right, we know that that person was in his hand. And the text will tell us it's an angel? Right, but they didn't know. Is there any instance of that? I'm just trying to think, you know, when I look back and say, well, that's kind of how that worked. Yeah, that was the question that came up, you know, last week, right? Is I think a lot new. I don't know what. Right. Yeah. Certain of the people around him didn't know, right? They wanted to have relations with him, drag him inside, and you know, awful. Yeah. But yeah, yeah just curious. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it's interesting. He knows had different conversations with people over the years. You know, kind of about this subject a little bit. It's like there's. Seems like it's hard for us to like find a balance, I guess, or hard for a lot of folks to find a balance to either like the guy. Over here on this end of the spectrum where oh, everything is an angel. Right. I'm always looking for an angel. I ran into an angel. You know, this happened, it must have been this. Yeah. You've probably got the other end of the spectrum where there's probably Yeah, they don't they don't do anything anymore. Right. Yeah. yeah. Supernatural doesn't exist, right? <clears throat> yeah. They were angels. He knew it was the Lord. We looked at that last week, uh, Genesis 18 and 19. But was there a case where they didn't know? Right. Says unwittingly. Yeah. We'd have to revisit those texts and carefully read them, probably to see that. Now Abraham, his his response was fought because we looked at this as a Christophany, and he worshipped, and it was accepted. So that's how we know that that's Yahweh God. Because otherwise, as Greg mentioned earlier, when John tried to do something similar, and not just John, I think Isaiah did the same thing. And, you know, so it's happened a couple times in Scripture where it's like, oh, don't do that. I'm a servant like you. Get up. Don't do that. So we know it's not right to worship angels. How about some churches venerate angels? Is that okay to venerate like if we, you know, lit candles to angels or whatever? Yeah, we. I think we all here have the kind of background we know that that's... That's wrong. So there's everything of every stripe that is wrong about the way to look at angels. Some people, like you say, in, the, in probably more charismatic circles, everybody sees an angel or sees a demon around every corner. And then you got the other extreme, which is like, ah, they, don't, they haven't done anything since Jesus' day, and they don't do anything today, despite Hebrews 13.2 that says contrary. Yeah. You talk about the Jacob's ladder thing. Yeah, it, it does say the man, but then when he's all done, two things are happening there in the text as you read it. One is uh, he refused to let go until he got received a blessing. Was he expecting to get a blessing from a man or an angel? Also, you look at the name of the place where he named this place as a memorial, and he says, I'm naming it this, and I forget the name, because I have seen God. So he knew, we don't know at what point he knew or what he re when he realized, but some, some point before he clutched him. And then afterwards, he's like, I'm not letting go until I get a blessing. And then afterwards, he says, I'm naming this spot here, this, because I have seen God. So it's a great question, though. They get to vicariously live through us a little bit and watch us, and I don't know. Pastor said this a while in Corinthians, where it says, you know, um, we're going to report a name, whatnot, because the angels are watching. Where I forget where that was, but yeah. Yeah. So we testify them. You know, yeah, we do. We are watched and observed by angels for for various reasons. I don't know how. I mean, I'm sure the angels probably get a laugh from us a lot, you know, because we're we can be so absurd. So there's got to be some things where they're really. What is it? Two, ten, three, ten, where it seems manifold wisdom because we. What's the word? Where we principalities of heaven and. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, all these. There could be a little truth in the, in all of these things, and, you know, I mean. I'm sure the angels, because they're holy, are more entertained by, not because we're some absurd sitcom, although we, 
rightly could be, but they're more entertained by watching God's plan of redemption play out, right? Because they're glorifying God all the time, and that's their design, that's intrinsically how they're made to glorify God. And some of those uh, heavenly beings, these holy beings, deliver messages, but sometimes they're just there to praise God and to lift him up. So even there, what's going on here with us is bringing glory to him and then yeah. staying open. Yeah, and the question... The same right, yeah. right, yeah, because the word entertaining has to do with hospitality and stuff, yeah. but... It's a mutual relationship all to bring glory to God. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what the text says, you know, and, and they're aware of what's going on around here, and they're watching, and they're observing, and... and um, She's saying when Lucifer, when Lucifer fell, for instance, and the, and the demons, right? There was, there's no redemption. There's no... You've got God's holy elect angels. Comparing that to us, and we, God gave us redemption. Right. And the difference in how angels... Well, then, I don't know if they have those attitudes, and that's what part of the thing was that triggered them or not. We know that Lucifer, he just wanted to ascend to the throne. And so... It's that attitude, that selfish attitude of I want more and more and more, and it's pride, thinking that you deserve more. So f for the fallen angels, there probably is an element of that. Like, how do these guys get this stuff? How do these guys get a second chance? And we don't. But then we see when we get to the eschatological texts about the end, you can see where that attitude's got to play out, where it's, it's going to be a scorched earth thing because I'm all in because I'm doomed anyway. So uh, we see in, in Revelation 12 where Satan is angry and he knows his time is short. So he goes after the woman. He goes after uh, the people of the book. Uh, he goes after everybody at that point and it's the gloves are off and he because he knows he's angry, it says, because he knows his time is short. And there's no, no chance for any redemption. He knows how it's going to play out. I'm going to take as many with me as I can, you know, that kind of, yeah. But the holy angels, it's hard to know what their, for one thing, it's hard for me to know what their motivation is and why they would care to watch um, what's going on down here other than to see how, watch God's plan of redemption play out because they're holy angels and I can't relate to that. You know, I have, I have profane thoughts. If I was watching something, it's like, ooh, this is going to be ugly. Watch this, you know. But... For holy angels, they're not going to feel that way at all necessarily. Their attitude is going to be one of seeing God's plan of redemption play out in the history of the ages and seeing what happens among the nations and how this puzzle piece fits this one. Look how the Lord did that. And even though Satan is trying to do this and the demons are doing this and man is trying to do this, God said it would be so. And look at this. It's exactly they're playing into God's hands. The things they're doing are the ones that are feeding this and making this happen. Glory to God, you know. I was thinking too of the sovereignty of God, and all of it that the angels have a better understanding. I'm sure they do. Yeah. I was just even, okay, we're, I was retraining here a little bit, but so the angels are also elect. So once they sinned, it was once and for all. There's no dying on the cross. I get that. But at the same sense, isn't that the same for us? We're elect. Well, we. So, we are able to sit, so we do understand redemption in its in its, but it's still wants in front. We're chosen from the beginning of time. We just well, it serves well to maybe visit a little bit. What does the term elect mean? In what value? Because we tend to think sometimes in terms of election or or um, you know the doctrine of election or whatever. We tend to think of election in a different way in salvific ways. But what does the word elect really mean? Each of chose or elect and it's for a certain specific purpose, right? You could be chosen for a, as a vessel for dishonor. We know from the scriptures too, right? Yeah. Exactly right. But if, if so if he were to allow the angels to sin, then they could not be with him. So in electing angels to minister and to be up there with him, they could not have any sin. Because then they wouldn't be holy and they wouldn't be able to be in 
Right, so there was, so it wasn't when the devil and his angels fell, it wasn't an accidental falling. And it was all for an intended purpose, all for God's purposes, all for his glory. So let's finish up this then about at least in in Christ. And um, we mentioned too that, okay, so we had these visitations that are surrounding his birth. There's another point in between that we missed where the angels also entered into the second one we wanted to look at was specifically, we, we saw the, the role of angels, but then looking in the life of Jesus, and we already mentioned some of these because it came up, but we saw the announcement of Jesus to Mary, the announcement of Jesus to Joseph, right? We saw the announcement of John. We saw the announcement to the shepherds when the birth happened. We saw the angel come in and let Joseph know, flee to Egypt. But then after that was something really significant that happened too, right? And it was another big deal, similar to the Egypt deal where Satan is trying to take baby Jesus out. Do you remember the temptation when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? And at the end of 40 days, what happened? Ministering spirits there. So angels came to take care of Jesus there in the wilderness. And I don't know what that meant. Did they, I mean, they strengthened him is, is what we get from the text. So ministered to him. But, I, you know, they give him a drink of water. I don't know what they did. Ministered to him. Like deacons. So whatever it was, maybe they strengthened him, helped him get, when those 40 days were up, helped him get back into town somewhere where he could clean up and get a bite to eat and get a drink and all the things he needed. But ministered to him. Strengthened him is what we get from the text. And then... We see this in, in the garden. We see this at the resurrection where they announced again that he had res resurrected. So significant event in history, right, is concerning Christ, concerning his birth, concerning his death at the resurrection. We only touched on, we're really about out of time, but we're, we only touched on the presence of angels in the early church, which is the third point, but everybody kind of brought some of those things up. Maybe we'll take um, a little time to look at that next time, but appearing to Peter and freeing Peter from prison. What you might want to look at is um, Herod was intending to free Peter from prison anyway. So that begs the question, well, then why did an angel break him out? If Herod was getting ready to free Peter, was getting ready to send him out of prison. What's going on there? So you might look in Acts at that. That's kind of interesting. Why would, why would that happen? And here's the other thing that happened. Is that was breaking the law. He was in there legally, at least for their day. Why is it, why is it okay to do that? And when is it okay to go ahead and break the law? <laughs> I think we all know the answer to that, but that's just an example of that kind of a thing, right? So, so anyway, we haven't picked any questions about any of that. Some good questions and comments. Stuff to think about and ruminate. We might entertain angels at some point this week. So we don't know. Let's close in prayer real quick.